Hello, my name is Maria Jalikar. Welcome to my show, Let's Talk About History. I'm here today at Historic Days at the Norwichtown Green, and we're going to take a look around. I hope you enjoy my show. Thank you. Hello. This lady here is basket weaving. And can you tell me a little bit about where you get your your um the fibers for weaving? The fibers I get for weaving are from the rattan palm. They are an import into this country, but they were imported into Europe as early as the 1500s. And so baskets were used pretty frequently for um, all types of purposes in the kitchen and everywhere. 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 This is before plastic. This is before lightweight uh, cardboard. This is before paper bags. You had baskets for everything from uh, taking coal out of coal mines, rock ore, to gathering heavy uh, vegetables in your fields, to berry picking, to carrying small tools to hold them, to having candles on your walls so that the mice couldn't get to them. So is this an, an art that would be in the family that a wife would be doing this or or would, you, would there be a basket weaver in town that you would purchase baskets from if you lived in a city you'd probably have a basket maker somewhere if you were out in the country you'd probably know how to we, to fix your own baskets or weave your own baskets or find someone that you could barter with to repair your baskets well thank you very much Okay, so what is this called, what you're doing? This is weaving. I'm weaving cloth. This is a modern loom, but it's much the same. As so this is how you would make fabric? Correct. And a, most of a woman's time in the 18th century was spent with some sort of textile um, process, either weaving, spinning, making clothing, repairing clothing, uh, dyeing. Mm -hmm. And where would you get the colors for the fabric? You would make your own dyes. Okay. Yeah. And where would you get your dye from? You'd make it. You'd, you'd have to get its plants, um, insects, oh. roots, oh. Okay, nice. uh, flowers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like beets would be the color for burgundy for your dye? You could, or what was most popular was cochineal, which is a little beetle that really? they still use today. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. All right, ma'am, thank you very much. You're welcome. And some of the some of the uh, fabric would come from flax, but what other no, kind of This is cotton. This is cotton. Normally they wouldn't in the 18th century cotton wouldn't be as accessible because it was expensive and you'd have to pay a tax to Great Britain um, because it would have to be processed there first. So mostly it was flax um, into linen or wool, mm -hmm. oh, for the most part. Thank you very much. I see you have some rifles here. Can you tell me what the dates of these rifles are? Okay, the bottom one is not a rifle. It's a smoothbore musket. It's called the Brown Best Musket. It's uh, a reproduction, but very faithfully reproduced. It would have been made in 1762 by a, uh, an armorer named Grice for the King of England. 
and it does have the markings of the King of England on there. Um, it is a smoothbore musket, and it's loaded with paper cartridges, which you see in my cartridge box. 75 caliber. The center one. What would that be used for? It's a military arm. Yeah, military arm. The middle one is a Pennsylvania long rifle, 50 caliber. This would have been used by hunters or snipers, that type of thing. Um, yeah, I can't remember what it's called. And, uh, how, what year is that one? Of this could have been anywhere from uh, 1760 on up through. Actually, they still make them in modern times now. This is a reproduction of that one uh, made in Ardessa, Spain. This third one is a 36 caliber small game rifle. Would it be comparable to uh, like a 22 caliber of today? It is of a later period because it has a uh, cap lock, percussion cap ignition. Actually, when I got this, it did come with the flint lock on it. But uh, the same company made the later period ignition system, so. I bought that and put that on so I could switch back and forth if I want to. Mm -hmm. um, so um, for hunting, uh, what kind of animals would they hunt uh, around here? Well, deer? Deer. There weren't as many deer in those days as there are now, but yes, deer. Uh, this type of uh, smoothbore weapon could be used either with a round ball, which I have a sample of down there, or uh, birdshot, similar to what a shotgun would use today. Oh. Birdshot, you would look, shoot at ducks or squirrels or what have you. This was primarily used for small game like squirrels or rabbits. Uh, this one would be for uh, bigger game or even you know human targets. Uh, this is very very accurate, easily accurate to over 200, 250 yards. This musket is very inaccurate, okay. but it wasn't intended to be that accurate because you wanted firepower, many men firing. So what would be the closest one that they would have maybe on the Mayflower when they came over? Uh, none of these. None of those? Earlier versions. Okay. They had something called a match lock. Oh, okay. This is a flint lock. Okay. A uh, match lock had a similar type of ignition with the powder in the pan, but it had a uh, actually a cord it was kind of dangerous too. They had a smoldering cord attached to the the hammer, if you want to call okay. it that, and they would lower it down into the priming pan to ignite the priming powder. Mm -hmm. But when you reloaded it, this is still smoldering, so <laughs> pretty scary, you know, because you got powder with live burning embers okay. right here. All right, can you tell me about some of these objects here on your blanket? Sure. What you see here on this half are all the equipment that a rifleman would use and carry with him. Uh, a rifleman's knife, a patch knife to cut the cloth patches to go around the bullets, a powder horn, a priming horn, a short starter, and a powder measure, and then a, a uh, tomahawk. Um, there's a flint lock. So this holds, holds uh, flints? No, the flints are over here in the pouch. Now, everything on this side is the equipment that a militia person would have. That's a uh, cartridge box, which holds the paper cartridges that you can see in the box. And that's what's loading the musket. And then spare flints, a screwdriver tool to take the musket apart for cleaning. A belt, the belt knife, bayonet for the musket because this, this musket takes a bayonet. And the flask is for your whiskey? No, that's somewhere else. Uh, uh, that's for water, canteen for water. Okay. Uh, we always had to carry so, canteen. Which one of these did you say would be used maybe for the militia? Well, I think it's in the okay. The, the musket. Okay. Alrighty. Okay. Thank you.
Can you tell me something about your uniforms and what um, army you would be in? Okay, our uniforms are the is a replica uniform of the third officer on board ship during the War of 1812. Um, our uniform, we're, we're the Sailing Masters of 1812 Fife and Drum Corps out of Essex, Connecticut. Oh, nice. And we're keeping alive the history of Essex during the War of 1812 when the British raided the town. So when the Corps organized, reorganized in 1963, they actually went down to Annapolis to one of the museums down there and sketched out the uniform. Oh. So when they came back, we had replicas made Great. of the uniform of the day. Can you tell me some of the names of the men that served in Essex in 1812? Uh, well, what happened in 1812 in Essex is the British came up the Connecticut River and burnt our shipyard down to the water line um, for the simple fact that Essex was, a, was building all the privateer ships that were going out to harass the British, and the British got really kind of tired of it, and they just came and burnt us out. It was the militia that, you know, did what it had to do, and as a matter of fact, the call went out to the militias for Hadline, Chester, Deep River, Killingworth, and it took the British almost two nights to get out of the Connecticut River. Oh my goodness. Because of all the bombardment. It's amazing. So with that naval history in how Essex. Long did, how long did that war last? The War of 1812, yes. uh, the Treaty of Ghent was signed December 24th, I believe, 18, 18, eight, no, no, 1813, no, 1814. Oh, so it only lasted a couple years. Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep, and the last battle was actually fought in New Orleans in January after the treaty was signed because word hadn't gotten to New Orleans yet. So. You look beautiful, and you Thank look you. so handsome. Very so nice, much. very nice suits. Thank you. Are you in the parade at Christmas with the drum and fife? Uh, down in Old Saybrook. Oh, okay. Yes, the Sa we do the Saybrook Torchlight Parade. Um, as a matter of fact, we do a lot of parades throughout Connecticut, a few scattered around New England. Um, okay. Like I said, we're a fife and drum corps. And oh, nice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Hello, I'm here with Norwich's historian, Dale Plummer, and Dale has a booth here at the History Days at Norwich Town Green. Um, Dale, can you tell me what your booth is about today? Yes, I'm representing the Norwich uh, World War I Memorial Committee. We are working on uh, commemorating the 100th anniversary of World War I. There will be a big celebration on November 11th of this year. And we're all, that's going to be at Chelsea Parade on November 11th at 1 o'clock. Uh, we're also raising money to restore the World War I howitzer that was at the end of Chelsea Parade. Uh, it, it, um, it has deteriorated and it needs a considerable amount of work to bring it back to shape. So we're in the process of, of doing that uh, as a way of honoring those who served in the First World War. We think about 2,000 people from Norwich served in the war. And um, if anyone would like to make a donation, uh, who can they call or for information? Well, they can certainly contact uh, me, 860-949-5784, uh, or email me at cityhistorian at norwichct.org. Uh, or they can simply send a check into the finance department of the city at 100 uh, Broadway uh, with the memo World War I Howitzer Restoration. Okay, Dale, thank you very much. You're and welcome. I hope you reach your goal. We will. And um, have fun today. I have have a nice ready. day. It's Great. Good to see you, Maria. But same here, Dale. And it's a beautiful day today. I hope you're out here enjoying this um, oh, history day. And I, I hope we, we, they continue to have this every year. Thank you. Okay, can you tell me what war this is representing? This will be 100 years ago. This will be World War I. Oh, great. This is a standard Taylor Model 30 rolling field kitchen. 
This was designed to feed 250 men a company. Oh. Now, most of the AEF World War I food source was bacon, coffee, canned salmon, canned corned beef, corned beef hash, and canned stewed tomatoes. They reduced the shipping down from some of the other canned vegetables to those main components. Everything's canned because you had to ship it too. It was gas impervious to the front line. Mm. Crackers came in a metal sealed tin and bread is baked by a field bakery company. They did nothing but bake loaves of bread every day. You'd have piles this high. In the evening we'd send a supply wagon back. They'd get more canned goods, more bread, more water, and hopefully make it to the position. This would probably be about one to two miles behind the front line okay. if it was in the line feeding the troops. They so come is out. this when they were actually camping? This is when they're areas? in the line. Oh, in line. In the line. And they would carry this equipment. And this would be up here. Now, if you were out of the line, i.e. out of the trenches, you'd probably be three, four, five, six miles back, further back. Now, today, usually the uh, Salvation Army girls do the donuts, but being an enterprise and cook that I am, I got hold of some ingredients, and I'm going to make donuts today oh, nice. for my buddies. Oh, nice. Wonderful. I will enjoy your day today. I will try. At History Day, and thank you very much. All righty. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day.
Uh, can you tell me about your book that you've written here? Yes, Aaron Dwight Stevens was born in Lisbon, and he lived uh, right around the corner here from the Green uh, in Norwich after he uh, grew up a little bit, and his father became the uh, choir director at the church there. Uh, Aaron Dwight Stevens uh, was an adventurer, and he uh, went off to war against Mexico. He went out to the New Mexico and, and, and the elite dragoons, and then he was in bloody Kansas fighting against slavery, and that's where he met John Brown. And uh, the, 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 the story is an exciting story about all the adventures that Aaron Dwight Stevens had, and then uh, when they tried to get rid of slavery, uh, they got caught in, in Harper's Ferry, and he was tried and hung with, uh, with John Brown. But uh, it, it's quite a good story, and uh, we can all be very proud of Aaron Dwight Stevens from Norwich. Uh, was he born about? Um, he was born. I, 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 I don't remember exactly, but uh, what did he live? Oh, he he, he died in 1850, 1860, in in March of 1860, which was one year before the Civil War started. So uh, they the raid on Harper's Ferry was one of the last things that happened that forced the Civil War, and uh, it changed this country forever. And, and he died, he was hung one day after his 29th birthday. <laughs> so where can you pur they purchase people if they're interested to purchase the books? Well, if they come down here, to, to, I got them here today, but you can get them on uh, uh, Amazon. Okay. And you can look at our um, webpage, which is thejourneytothegallows.com. Okay. And you can buy them there on the webpage. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect.